Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host this week, Mary Bartholson. Tonight, we will be speaking with Delegate Dan Helmer and Senator Dave Marsden about current events happening in Virginia politics and the issues which matter most to voters. Delegate Helmer is an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran, father, and small business leader. In 2019, he defeated Republican and 17-year incumbent Tim Hugo to become delegate for Virginia's 40th House of Delegates District. Delegate Helmer, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on Inside Scoop, Mary. I appreciate it. Uh, before diving in to the issues, I would like to start by asking you about yourself for those in our audience who are uh, who don't already know who you are. I know you've been on the show before. Can you tell us your story and what inspired you to get involved and run for office? Absolutely. I'm, I'm the son of an immigrant. I'm the grandson of refugees and Holocaust survivors. I grew up wanting to serve a country that not only welcomed my family but gave us so much opportunity. And it was that desire to serve that took me to West Point, carried me on tours around the world in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Korea. And years later, it was that desire to serve that caused us to launch a campaign to chart a different course for Virginia, uh, what we thought was a better course, because we thought it was wrong that Richmond politicians were trying to criminalize abortion. We, we thought it was wrong that in the wake of the Virginia Beach shooting, they weren't willing to do anything about gun violence. We thought it was wrong that too often our government served special interests instead of the interests of working families in Virginia. And so we ran and we won and have been able to lead on so many issues that are critical to making sure that Virginia is affordable for families here, making sure we protect access to safe and legal abortion, and making sure that we keep our streets safe from gun violence. Uh, what do you think prepared you more to hold elected office, uh, military service or fatherhood? Or, or how do you think those things prepared you to run for office? Well, I think they're both really important parts of who I am and why I enjoy serving so much in the House of Delegates. As a father, anybody who's a parent knows that there's just nothing more important than your lives, in, in our lives and in, in your kids. And so, you know, thinking about things like worrying about shootings in our schools, right? Like, that's something you want to do something about, and it's something we could do something about. It's really important. When you look at some of the MAGA extremists right now who are trying to whitewash our history, saying that our kids can't learn certain subjects that MAGA extremists deem unacceptable, like Martin Luther King or saying that people, are, you know, Native Americans are not immigrants. Like, they, you know, they say that you, we shouldn't teach our kids that. And you know, telling our teachers that they need to teach things like both sides of the Holocaust. So as a father, you learn about these things and you, you know you want to do something to affect change in our community making sure we're preparing our children uh, for jobs in the 21st century to be good citizens. And also, you know that you want to make sure they get a great education, they learn to be good citizens as well. And so I think that's been really important to me. Um, you know, what did I gain from my military service? You, you never asked somebody sitting next to you in a Humvee in Iraq or Afghanistan, are you a Republican, are you a Democrat? Instead, we come together as Americans bound by common values and we seek to see the mission through. And I think that's something that I know that when Democrats in the majority in Richmond, it was how we governed. And so I think that's something we carry with us. Uh, this year, when voters head to the polls on November 7th, they can expect to see new district numbers as well as new names on their ballots following redistricting, several retirements, and also the primary outcomes. So I, I think your new district number is District 10, is That's that correct? Right. That's right, I went from District 40 to District 10, but we, we kept it even 10s. Uh, so how has your district changed? Have the borders shifted? Uh, who was representing those areas before, if it has changed? Yeah, so currently my district runs from uh, Fairfax Station all the way out to Haymarket, so it inco incorporates parts of Northwest Prince William County and Southwest Fairfax County. My new district is only Southwest Fairfax County. It takes por uh, part of Delegate Eileen Filler Corns District and Delegate Bulova's district and appends them on. Uh, I still have Centerville and Clifton and Fairfax Station, which I had before, but I also add some Burke. 
Uh, are you finding when you're out knocking doors that people are aware that their district has shifted or changed, or are they being caught by surprise by that? Well, I think at this point we've had so many conversations. We've sent letters out to our community to make sure that they know about it. Uh, we've had teletown halls where uh, both our current constituents and future constituents have the ability to engage with us on the issues. So I'm hoping that people are aware of how the district has changed, and we'll continue to make sure we educate people through the election. Uh, my district was previously represented by Delegate Ken Plum, who served for 44 years. And I think that makes him one of the longest serving um, elected officials in the General Assembly in Virginia's history. And it seemed like a lot of people did not want to uh, serve without him because as soon as he announced his retirement, there were several more people who announced that they were retiring as well. Uh, do you know how many people announced their retirements this we year? We have 28 people who are leaving the General Assembly. Uh, not all of them retiring, some of them have stepped up to the Senate, but 28 vacancies, which is a huge amount of turnover, and that's before any changes through elections uh, that happened this year. So it's a, it's a, a massive amount of turnover, and we're losing incredible experience like the of Ken Plum, somebody we all called him affectionately number one because he was the most senior member of the House of Delegates, and we're going to miss his wisdom and the knowledge he had, and somebody who could tell you about the other time they thought about this issue and the time before that and how it's changed over time and we're, we've, we're gonna lose some of that and it, it's a bit sad but also really exciting to see all the energy from an incredibly diverse and talented group of people who are stepping up to serve in our Commonwealth. And I know with redistricting there were some incumbents that were placed in the same district so some of those um, retired uh, elected officials are going to have their areas covered by other incumbents, um, but there are some seats that are new and open. Uh, can you talk about a little bit about what the key races are right now or the battleground races? Yeah, you, you know, we have all 100 seats up in the House of Delegates this year, all 40 seats up in the Senate. It happens every four years in Virginia. I'm campaign chair for Virginia's House Democrats. And we are three seats away from having a Democratic majority here in Virginia. We hold a tenuous two-seat majority in the Senate. It's critical that we win, and we have a number of seats where we have an opportunity to do that. Uh, we have great candidates running in Prince William County, Josh Thomas and Travis Nemhard. In Western Loudoun County, we have Rob Bantz running in a, in a key district. Uh, in other parts of the state, uh, Josh Cole also in Fredericksburg, so uh, close to Northern Virginia. And then we have key races all throughout the state uh, in Henrico, uh, in uh, Hampton Roads that are going to determine whether we, whether we are able to take a majority that's so critical to making sure that MAGA extremists don't ban abortion, don't win their war in our schools, make sure we're continuing to be able to educate children and that Virginia women can make their own health care decisions. How many seats do Democrats need to pick up in order to get that majority back? So three seats. Three seats? Three so, seats. Uh, we're not too far off, so hopefully uh, we can be successful there. Uh, and I know that Glenn Youngkin was originally floated as a potential Republican presidential candidate, but this year he stated that he's suspending those ambitions to focus on um, getting control of the General Assembly and getting Republicans elected. And I know that you have been very active at getting out and supporting Democratic candidates. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about those key races that we're looking to win? Well, it is just so important that we have a Democratic majority. You know, like I said, when Democrats had a majority, we didn't seek to govern on behalf of one party, but we did it on behalf of all Virginians. And that's what we need again in Richmond, not the MAGA extremism that we're seeing Republicans try to bring to our Commonwealth. I mean, we've already seen what they're doing in our schools. We've seen them fill their ranks with insurrectionists who attacked our Capitol on January 6th, sought to overturn an election. MAGA extremists created an election integrity unit to cast doubt on future elections. And in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, they've proposed extreme abortion bans, including a ban, an extreme ban on all abortions without exception, 
including bans on some forms of contraception, even including bans on fertility treatments for Virginia couples looking to start a family. And in response to all this, I got a letter from a constituent, and she said I could share uh, her experience. So for years, she and her husband had sought to conceive, and she had gone through multiple IVF treatments till finally she got pregnant. And you can just imagine her excitement when she learned that. And then her devastation when she found out at 16 weeks that her fetus would likely die in utero and would certainly die if she gave birth. And she wrote to me, she said, Dan, I'm still in pain over my loss, but in a post-Roe America, in a youngkin controlled Virginia, I would have been forced to carry an unviable fetus to term and deliver a stillborn, a pain magnitudes greater than what I experienced. And so that's why it's so critical that we elect Travis Nemhard and Josh Thomas and Rob Vance and Joshua Cole and Susanna Gibson, Jairus Taylor, and all of these great candidates that are running all over Virginia who are taking on MAGA extremists, who are going to fight for a Virginia that works for all of us and it's aligned with our values. So it's safe to say if Republicans get a trifecta in November, we can expect a lot of people's rights to be rolled back. Uh, are Democrats positive about the, the outcome in November? Is there a positive outlook? Well, I think it's gonna take all of us to make sure we tell our neighbors and our friends what's at stake. The evidence is before us about what Republicans would want to do. They've introduced extreme abortion bans. When we talk about voting, we already have seen Republicans in some parts of the state limit early voting and shut down polling locations, something that I think is not just dangerous, but un-American. And I think sometimes people take the ability to vote for granted, they take bodily autonomy for granted, they think maybe they won't do that here in Virginia, but we've seen all of those laws, we've seen their actions, we've seen a MAGA governor who says he would sign any bill on abortion that comes to his desk. So I think it's incredibly important that we make sure we get out there and tell Virginians what's on the line and why it's so important that they go out and vote this November. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. We're about to go to a, a break. Uh, we'll be right back with more from Delegate Dan Helmer after the break to talk more about Virginia politics. So I just moved in with his family and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, hmm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. <laughs> no. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back. 
to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host this week, Mary Barthelson. Our guest tonight is Delegate Dan Helmer. Before the break, we talked a little bit about the plans that Republicans have for the state. Uh, should they be victorious in November? I want to ask you about what the issues are that Democrats are championing. Well, I think it's worth looking back a little bit to, say, to see that when we talk about what we want to do for Virginia, that we're building on some incredible successes. When Democrats had the majority in Richmond, we took on the NRA and we passed universal background checks and a red flag law and sought to keep firearms out of the hands of domestic abusers. We removed onerous and medically unnecessary restrictions on abortion. We took on the cost of health care, ending surprise billing and making sure that no working family in Virginia has to make a decision between whether they could put food on the table or get the medical care they need. And I think that we'd like to build on those efforts. We still have much to do because I feel like you should be able to go into a Walmart or study at the University of Virginia or just go on a stroll with your family without fear of being cut down by a bullet. It's one of the reasons that this past year I introduced an assault weapons ban and we would seek to carry that forward, make sure we put limits on high capacity magazines, make sure that we are keeping firearms out of the hands of children like what we saw happen uh, in, in other parts of the state. I and mean, we just really want to keep our families and our children safe. No teacher should go to school being worried that a kid's gonna come in with a gun and shoot her, particularly in elementary school. So we're gonna work hard on that. Uh, while we've passed, uh, while the state of play right now in Virginia is one in which we have protected women's access to safe and legal abortion. Right now that can change at the whim of a Republican administration and a Republican General Assembly. And I personally, look this is a personal issue for me. After our second son was born, my wife Karen was told that if she got pregnant again she could die. And I don't think Richmond politicians ought to be telling women what to do with their own bodies. And so I'd like us to pass a constitutional amendment to take the ability of Richmond politicians to make women's health care decisions for them away from them permanently. And then there's so much work left to do to make sure that our commonwealth is affordable for our families and our children. We're working hard on the cost of housing, the cost of health care, making sure that we bring good paying jobs to our commonwealth so that each of us has the ability to not only take care of our families, do a little bit more, maybe go out once a week or go on a vacation from time to time. That's the American dream and it's something we want to make sure that every family has access to here in Virginia. I want to dive into those issues a little bit more. Uh, so we recently had an elementary school teacher uh, take a gun to school and shoot his teacher. And a student, uh, yeah, a student. Yeah, yeah. a student, yeah. Uh, a young student. Um, how does Virginia um, compare with other states on things like safe storage laws. Is that something that we're looking at? We have a real opportunity to improve our safe storage laws to make sure we keep firearms out of the hands of children. Uh, we have opportunities and issues beyond that. So uh, one of the things that uh, we could use is better wait periods in Virginia. So if you look at the Walmart shooting, the individual who was involved bought the firearm that they used that day. Can we say that any single incident would have been stopped by a law? We don't know. But we can say that in states where you do have waiting periods, there are less of those types of shootings. In fact, in states that have passed common sense gun laws regularly, you see less gun violence counter to what the NRA and the VCDL will tell you. And so we're trying to bring common sense gun laws to Virginia to make sure that we're safe to keep our community safe, to keep ghost guns out of the hands of criminals. And I feel like this is something we should be able to bring people together on. Wanting to keep our families safe shouldn't be a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. And it's just so sad that so many MAGA extremists have given away their decision-making authority to the NRA and the gun lobby in order to take a few campaign bucks at the, at the expense of keeping our streets safe. 
I think that a lot of studies have showed that there are common sense gun reforms that are actually supported by many gun owners, and yet the NRA often opposes them, and uh, so do Republicans often. Um, Virginia did pass red flag laws, but from what I understand, there's money available uh, in order to make sure that those laws are enforced, and I don't think uh, Governor Young Youngkin accepted that money. Do you know if that's the Isn't case? Isn't it really sad that we have federal and state resources that are available to prevent gun violence in our community, and a few politicians are so scared of their grade with the NRA that they won't put that to good use? Yes, absolutely. And so you mentioned assault weapons ban is something that we're hoping to get done. Um, we've we're looking to strengthen our gun safe storage measures to protect children, uh, implement wait periods, and ensure that the state gets funding for red flag laws. Are there any other key areas of gun reform legislation that I, you think I we're think looking there's at? a critical look. I'm a gun owner myself. Mm -hmm. I think you can support the Second Amendment as you support every other amendment of the Constitution and believe in common sense to keep our community safe. And I'll, and I'll take umbrage of one thing you said. I don't think this is a Republican or a Democrat issue. Uh, I think Democrats and Republicans alike, people who live in our communities, support common sense when it comes to gun safety. I think it's sad that elected Republicans are so scared of the gun lobby that they won't join us in measures like keeping ghost guns out of the hands of criminals in supporting universal background checks, that our red flag law was at risk, that they passed a bill out of the House. Fortunately, the Senate stopped it. When you walk around Fairfax County today and you walk into a public park, you see a sign with a handgun and a big cross through it. Because we passed a bill that said counties can keep firearms out of sensitive places. And Republicans sought to put pistols back in playgrounds. That's not where we need to go, and it's something we're going to fight to make sure it doesn't happen. And uh, so another issue that you touched on that I want to talk about is women's rights, specifically women's reproductive rights, because Virginia is now the only state in the South without a post-Roe v. Wade uh, abortion ban in place. And the progress that we um, saw in 2020 under Governor Northam is only being protected by a slim majority in the Senate. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what Democrats are doing to make sure that that's protected? Well, the number one thing we are trying to do is pass a constitutional amendment to protect access to safe and legal abortion. MAGA Republicans in the House of Delegates stopped us from moving that amendment forward this year. An amendment is something that goes through two consecutive legislative sessions and then goes before the people, uh, two consecutive legislative sessions with a vote in between. And we know why they're stopping it. They're stopping it because they know that the vast majority of Virginians support access to safe and legal abortion, who believe that women and their clinicians ought to make their own health care decisions. And what is extreme is a governor who has said he would sign any bill. I've seen the bills, bills that would define life is beginning at conception, not allow any exceptions for abortion, not for rape, not for incest, not for the life or the health of the mother, that wouldn't allow for in vitro fertilization to help people who are desperately trying to start a family, that would ban some forms of contraception. That's what the other side is trying to do, and that's why Democrats are supporting a constitutional amendment to make sure that we protect the ability of Virginia women to decide for themselves what's right for them. Uh, and the third issue that you touched on was cost of living. So Fairfax and across Virginia, we're, we're seeing an increase in homelessness among the elderly because they're on a fixed income, and when costs go up, especially housing, um, a lot of them end up homeless or living in poverty. Can you talk about what is being done to make sure that cost of living is affordable for everyone? It, it's a really important question, Mary. And I'll say um, 
as a Fairfax, as a, as a representative and a member of the Fairfax delegation, I hear all the time about how expensive it is. Someone who runs a business uh, here in Northern Virginia, I see how hard it is to attract young people today because of how far, how hard it is for them to afford to, to live here and they have to seek multiple roommates at, you know, in their mid-twenties in order to be able to afford to live in Northern Virginia. And I always often think of it as a Northern Virginia as a urban and suburban problem. But in traveling all around the state this year, I hear from so many people about how expensive it is gotten to live. And so we're fighting to facilitate new construction, to facilitate new solutions that increase uh, access to high density housing in some places, to provide grants to encourage building, to provide new opportunities uh, that create good paying jobs that allow people to afford here, to support the ability of folks to join a union so they can drive up their wages and actually have the wages that they need uh, to live here. Uh, we're working on making sure that health care is affordable. I'm particularly proud of a bill that I passed that requires that hospitals disclose all of their prices so that you know what a procedure ought to cost and we drive competition in our hospitals to lower the cost of care. Uh, we are working on a prescription drug affordability board to make sure that seniors and everybody else can afford their prescriptions. And it was one of the saddest things of this session when Republicans defeated our effort to bring a prescription drug affordability board to Virginia. So there are amazing opportunities to work on cost, to make sure Virginia is affordable, to attract exciting, good paying union jobs to Virginia. And we just need a majority that's going to be able to fight for those things. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. And we have a, about a minute left. So can you share with us how our audience can support your work if they feel inspired by what you've shared tonight? Yeah, so I encourage everybody, if you can, go to danhelmer.com or go to our leadership pack, secureprogress.org. If you believe, like I do in a Virginia, where women make their own health care decisions, where you can take a stroll in the evening and not live in fear of being cut down by a bullet. If you believe in a Virginia where our government serves our interests and not special interests, then you can go today, you can join us, you can help us elect the great and exciting and thoughtful people we need in order to have a democratic majority that's gonna fight for all of us and our shared values. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us tonight and sharing that. I'm sure uh, our, our audience will be sure to check out your website, uh, maybe send you a donation or perhaps volunteer. Make sure to stick around. After the break, we will be speaking with State Senator Dave Marson about Vir the Virginia Senate and upcoming elections. Coming up shortly. Nice going, Spencer! I can't believe we broke old man Hennessy's window. Correction, dude. You broke. I just threw the ball. This is really bad. What are we gonna do? We? we? Go to the door and ask for the ball back. Are you serious? It's my ball, Myrtlebeck. You're so dead. I'd run away. Yeah, to Uruguay. Kiss your life goodbye. Sorry. Let's go. Hey. Yeah. Remember me in your well. Some friends you are. an accident and we can fix the window come on i'll come with you loyalty pass it on you go first a message from the foundation for a better life one day these rats will play in the woods one of some matches and that's no good listen to smoke before you give it a try only you don't play with matches don't play with fire can prevent wildfires. Fire. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. What's that? 
to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host this week, Mary Bartholson. We are joined by Senator Dave Marston. Senator Marston has represented the 37th District in the Senate of Virginia since 2010. Prior to his election to the Senate, Senator Marston served as the 41st District uh, representative in the House of Delegates from 2006 to 2010. Uh, Senator Marston, thank you so much for being here. Can you share more about what your journey has been like to get here? Well, thank you for, uh, for having me. And uh, it, it's kind of been a long one. I didn't get into politics till I was 57 years old. But uh, uh, I worked for our juvenile court for 30 years, ended up running our juvenile detention center for the last 17, and became president of the Virginia Juvenile Justice Association. So I was responsible for uh, any legislation that they proposed to take it to the General Assembly, find a sponsor, and help get the bill passed. And I formed a relationship with Delegate Jim Dillard, and uh, we became friends. And uh, when I retired in 1999, uh, he asked me to run his campaign, so I ran several campaigns for him, and then uh, as a result of uh, one of them, I uh, ran the, uh, I was appointed by Governor Jim Gilmore uh, to uh, be Chief Deputy and then Acting Director of Virginia's Department of Juvenile Justice, and I also served under Mark Warner, and it was Mark who helped me get started uh, to run for office in 2005. I want to talk to you a little bit about the current events in the Senate. So there has been redistricting, uh, retirements, and also primaries, and that's going to make some changes for voters in the November 7th elections. And I believe that in the 40-member Senate, there's going to be at least 15 new members. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those changes? Well, they will be significant. Uh, you know, the Senate has uh, generally tends to have longer serving members, a higher percentage of longer serving members. And uh, we're having a lot of retirements, some of them forced on people because of uh, redistricting. They got placed into districts they couldn't win, or they got placed into a district with someone they didn't want to run against. And uh, so that's led to huge turnover. And uh, uh, some of my favorite and, and closest associate uh, Republicans, I'm a Democrat, uh, are leaving, and it's, it's hard to imagine a Senate without, uh, a Virginia Senate without Emmett Hanger, and, uh, and uh, uh, he's just a hero of mine, just the, the way he conducts, you know, his, his business, and, uh, but we're losing uh, Dick Saslaw, who our majority leader here in, uh, in uh, Fairfax, and he's the majority leader of the Senate. Uh, we're losing Janet Howell to retirement as well. Uh, George Barker was defeated in a primary. Chap Peterson was defeated in a primary. And uh, we had uh, the, the Speaker of the House, the uh, Majority Leader, and five uh, committee chairmen, and now we're down to one committee chairman, I chair of transportation. But uh, uh, that, that assignment will probably change when I get back down to Richmond. But we'll have a lot of new members. We'll have to go and, uh, and to make sure that uh, we don't leave uh, uh, people behind and that they can uh, have a proper It happens really quick down in Richmond. We're, we're deal with maybe 2,000 bills and uh, in just a matter of two months and have to put together a two-year state budget. So uh, it's uh, dawn to dusk and uh, we, we work at it really hard, but it's a, it's a real privilege to serve. Uh, so I think there's like four or five um, members of the Senate who are, are being changed over due to the primary results. Um, and you mentioned a couple of them. So Joe, Joe Morrissey, George Barker, Lionel Sp Spruill, Chop Peterson, and um, I think Jeremy McPike was able to hold on to his seat. Yes, he was. And, and uh, Cree Deeds as well. Okay, yes, that was the other one. And so do you think that the Democrats in Virginia have shifted more from the Blue Dog Democrat more to the uh, Liberal Democrat, or do you think that the, there's more party loyal, loyal, loyalty now? I know that some of those voters were swing voters. Uh, well, I think uh, you're right. I think uh, on both sides of the aisle, I think the Republican uh, caucus will be a little more conservative. Uh, the, uh, the Senate uh, Democratic caucus will be a little bit more progressive and uh, what have you. But generally what happens in the Senate, uh, it's a different culture than the House, is that some of that will get dialed back. Uh, people who come over uh, as very progressive, you know, tend to uh, dial that back a little bit. People who come in very, very conservative in the Senate tend to dial it back. And uh, you know, we need a we need a strong center uh, in this state to get things done. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, the things, some of the most important things I've done in the Senate, for instance, I started our cannabis, uh, medical cannabis industry in Virginia, and that was with the help of three Republicans who went to a reluctant uh, Judiciary Committee chairman of their own party and said, come on, this is for kids with intractable epilepsy, which is all I was attempting to do at the time. And now we have a tens of million dollar uh, industry in medical cannabis providing relief to people all over the Commonwealth. But I couldn't have done that without uh, support from Republicans who I, I had worked with. Same thing happened with, you know, we're a no parole state. A 14 year old sentenced to life without prison, uh, without uh, uh, parole, uh, is basically sentenced to die in prison. There's some small chance of geriatric parole in their 60s. Uh, but with the help of some Republicans and of course my Democratic colleagues, after 20 years of incarceration, they got an opportunity uh, to uh, appear before the parole board. Uh, and in a no parole state, that was a pretty big deal. It's the only exception we have to, uh, to no parole. Uh, and it, uh, we've released some, some young people already who've turned their lives around and it's, it's very inspiring. But you know, we get things done in the Senate because we, we tend to work together. Are we going to agree on abortion or guns or taxes? Uh, maybe taxes some of the time, but on some of those other issues, uh, we're not going to agree. But we have to, we have to govern. And 95% of what we do has nothing to do with some of those issues that we feel so passionate about on our side and they feel passionate about on their side. Uh, but we've got to get things done and the Senate's always been a, uh, a paragon of, 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 of working together. Uh, it, not every day is roses, but uh, uh, you know, we do have an opportunity because we're a smaller body to uh, get to know each other and to work unofficially with each other and, and, uh, and, uh, and make things happen. So I imagine that with all of that changeover, there's going to be a lot of shakeup in uh, how the, the committees are organized, um, both from retirements and just new, uh, new faces coming into politics, because I know a lot of those positions are assigned based on seniority. And you were on, you were chair of the Transportation Committee, I believe, and um, but that could potentially change. I think you were floated as potentially being chair for commerce and labor. Uh, so I'm curious to get your thoughts about um, some of those changes and talk to you as well about um, what some of those priorities of those committees will be. Well, commerce and labor uh, is a very, very busy committee and it deals with you know, very, very complex issues relating to business and labor. And, uh, you know, if, if, and it's up to my caucus and to what some of the folks who are senior to me, I'll be fourth in seniority in the Senate uh, Democratic Caucus and eighth overall in the Senate. Uh, but we, we predominantly go on seniority uh, in terms of committee chairmanships. But what I want to focus on is I was chief co-patron of the Clean Economy Act in Virginia, which requires us to be carbon neutral by 2045 and the Dominion Territory in 2050 in Appalachian Power. Uh, in their territory. And, um, you know, we really don't know how much progress we've made. A number of problems are beginning to emerge in terms of siting these facilities. Uh, there are environmental concerns. Uh, you know, right now, uh, if a, 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 a rural locality that is relatively modest in terms of their revenue and their means uh, were to take on a, a, a solar project, it would make them wealthier. That's good, right? But the way Virginia law works, they're also, they also receive their school funding based on their degree of wealth. So in other words, it could be a situation where they get wealthier, they lose school money from the state. So we gotta figure that out. We have got to figure out any number of issues around the environment to, to make sure that as we install solar projects, we're not using prime farmland, we're not cutting down trees. You know, trees are an essential part of sequestering carbon. And uh, that's, that is critical. So I want to have, uh, after our session this year, is a two-day symposium to start answering these questions uh, about you know, how we proceed and how we make the Clean Economy Act work. Uh, nothing as it is originally envisioned uh, you know, ever holds up under scrutiny unless you, you know, periodically look at it and find ways to make it practical and make it work. And, uh, and that's uh, one, of my, uh, one of my big goals uh, for the, uh, uh, the upcoming session is to get that symposium organized and then so that in 2025 uh, we can have legislation uh, put forth before the General Assembly and the governor to solve those problems and keep Virginia moving towards because it's not just a question of clean air uh, and uh, carbon, 
it is also a question of our economy. These are jobs that we're going to create for uh, wind turbines, for solar um, uh, manufacture, for solar installation. This is the new economy in Virginia, and I want to be there to make it work. That sounds very good to me. So um, the Virginia Clean Economy Act it was passed in 2020, and it establishes a renewable energy portfolio standard to mandate the two utilities in the state, Dominion Energy and Appalachian Electric Power, produce 100% renewable by 2045 and 2050. And it also sets energy efficiency standards. So uh, I'm, I'm curious if you intend to ensure that there are, uh, or how you intend to ensure that those targets are hit. Well, it's tricky. Uh, you know, to do that because, you know, we have to provide Dominion and Appalachian Power with a set of laws and regulations and uh, 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 the guidelines that they need to make it happen. You know, we can't put, uh, uh, we can't put impediments in their path and, and expect them to succeed, so we have to remove those impediments uh, and help them uh, get to the, the goals that uh, those of us, at least on my side of the aisle, uh, want to see happen, which is a, a, a clean uh, economy in Virginia and a clean environment. And uh, we're, uh, uh, Dominion uh, is also faced with the challenge of, uh, of ever increasing numbers of data centers. I think right now probably 30, 31 percent of, uh, of uh, our electricity in Virginia goes towards operating these data centers. They are huge uh, uh, power draws on, on our grid. And uh, I think we need to look at legislation to make sure that if these things are put in place, you know, can we look at uh, geothermal uh, to make sure, because the heating and the, uh, the heating air conditioning of these, uh, of these buildings is just enormous. These, uh, especially the air conditioning, these, these uh, units create just a tremendous amount of heat. They're even talking in Southwest Virginia about pumping uh, water from uh, abandoned mines, which is 55 degree water, and pumping that into data centers if we can get them down there. But they have to be located near uh, uh, power lines and near where they can easily be accessed to the grid. The other thing I'm working on and have worked on with the Northam administration to, to, you know, to make this possible is business ready sites. You know, we're, we're losing out to uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Uh, because we have not got business ready sites and I've worked with the Northam administration to get several hundred million dollars put in. I chair the subcommittee on the, in the Virginia Senate on uh, economic development and natural resources and I'll tell you about that after the break. Thank you. Yes, we will be right back. Uh, don't go anywhere. We will have a short break and then we'll return for more discussion with Senator Morrison about his priorities in the Senate and renewable energy. It's a beautiful day out here, sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 70 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Come on, that's it, let's go. Dad, wait till you see the bike we got for Jake. Hearing loss happens gradually with age, making it easy to ignore. Yet most older Americans aren't getting their hearing tested. Untreated hearing loss can keep your loved ones from enjoying what they cherish most. Dad, can you hear me? Don't let that happen. Speak up about hearing loss. You'll be glad you did. You can't buy a best friend. You can love them, pet them, care for them, whether they want you to or not. You can take a picture, you can jump, yell, you can fly to the moon, travel the world, or just stay in bed. You can't buy a best friend like that, but you can adopt one. Cause we're
Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm your host, Mary Barthelson. We are joined by Senator Dave Marsden for a conversation about Virginia politics. Uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about the Virginia Clean Economy Act and your plans to support renewable energies in Virginia. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Well, it is, uh, it, you know, it's critical that we, uh, we provide this state with, uh, with, with green energy. Uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, going to have to make very careful plans to uh, uh, continue to develop data centers in this state, which are, are great sources of, of uh, economic development in Virginia. Not only union labor in, in building them, uh, but uh, they provide revenue without a whole lot of government services to, to, uh, um, to have to pay for, uh, because the data center kind of operates all by itself, with just very few employees. So the, um, you know, the issue you know, for us is to continue to create not only green energy through wind and solar. As you know, Dominion Power is developing 206 windmills uh, off the uh, coast of Virginia, 26 miles out. I've been out to see them. They're enormous. And uh, they'll provide, I think, the power for either 600 or 800,000 homes. I can't remember. Just a huge step forward. Uh, you know, we're somewhere in the, in the upper 30s uh, percent of our state's electricity is provided by nuclear power, which is, by its definition, clean. A little dangerous, but, but uh, certainly clean. But the windmills are going to be a game changer. And, you know, we're developing solar projects all over the Commonwealth of Virginia. But the low-hanging fruit is kind of uh, disappearing quickly, and it's going to be more complex in terms of where we site these projects. For instance, you can't do it very much in Fairfax County. Uh, so I think where we can contribute more in the suburban and urban areas is in efficiency. And as a matter of fact, I've got Dominion Power right now putting a report together for me on just exactly where their successes and failures have been around efficiency. And a lot of that depends on us. Uh, Dominion had a plan one time that you would save significantly with reduced rates after 9 o'clock at night. You know, take your shower, do your laundry, uh, run the dryer, run the washing machine after 9 o'clock at night, and we'll save you big bucks. People didn't care. They didn't do it. You know, it just wasn't convenient. So uh, it's a shared responsibility. I think people are more aware now of the fact that, you, you know, we just can't expect government to do everything or our energy companies to do everything or our environmental groups to do everything. We have to kick in as well if we're going to, you know, to make this, uh, make this work. But I was talking about our, our uh, uh, business ready sites. We're trying to attract manufacturing back to the state to replace the furniture, textiles, coal, tobacco, railroads that uh, disappeared uh, from the south side and southwest economy in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, that used to be the economic engine of our state, and it's gone. And those people are, uh, were left high and dry, uh, you know, without careers, without jobs. Uh, and uh, we want to restore that uh, to them, but we need to be competitive. And so what we're doing is we're putting money into preparing these sites, either through plans or, or in sometimes the actual work, to make sure that they have the utilities they need, the water that they need, uh, the road structure that they need, so that we can tell a Ford Motor Company, come on in, you can do a parts plant here, you can do a tire plant if you're a rubber company, you know, we'll have the labor for you. And this is all coordinated through the Virginia Economic uh, Development uh, Authority, uh, partnership actually, not authority, uh, you know, who uh, you know, is working all the time trying to attract business and industry to Virginia. They do an amazing job, but we've got to give them a good product and, and economic parity between our rural and urban uh, uh, parts of Virginia is key to us getting back on the same page as a commonwealth and not being so divided by politics. Uh, the economy has just been a huge disruptor in this state, as it has in many states. And we need to, to look after our friends in rural Virginia and take care of some of their problems. And honestly, the, when Republicans were in, in charge in Virginia, they didn't make much progress uh, with, with doing it. But I will say this for my Republican colleagues, they did expand Medicaid after years of fighting it, years and years and years. They said, okay, now's the time for change. And the, and the guy who stood up on the floor of the, uh, of the House of Delegates and said we ought to do this, uh, Delegate Terry Kilgore, I asked him afterwards, I said, after you did that, it went very smoothly. Did anybody say anything? You've been vilifying it for years. And he said, nope, nobody said a word. Terry's word was good enough. And uh, the whole rural Virginia got on board with Medicaid expansion. Uh, so I'm an engineer, and 
I'm very interested in uh, renewable energy and jobs in that sector. And I believe there was a plan with Ford to bring somewhere around 2,500 jobs to the state. And uh, I think that deal fell through um, under Governor Yunkin. Uh, do you, can you share a little bit about that? Uh, it, it's inexplicable, really. It, it had some connection in his mind to the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party that somehow or another they were going to have undue influence over what went on at this particular plant. And that plant ended up in Michigan. And uh, now, I'm, I, you know, I love my friends from Michigan, but, you know, we need jobs here in Virginia. And that was a huge, huge disappointment to have made that decision for, I think, seemingly political purposes. And uh, it just threw, threw a lot of folks right under the bus uh, who needed those jobs. And uh, it was very, very unfortunate. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think there's any time you're dealing with a business from, from uh, the Republic of China that you're not dealing with the Chinese Republican or Chinese uh, uh, Communist, Communist Party. Party. You are, uh, you are indeed dealing with it no matter, no matter what. I mean, it is a, a state-run economy. And, uh, uh, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to move on. We're going to get these business-ready sites up and going and, and start, you know, reinventing manufacturing. And hopefully people from other parts of the state will begin to repopulate Southside Virginia and Southwest Virginia. And, uh, and we can rebuild those, uh, rebuild those economies. And I think we'll be able to communicate better with each other when there's more parity in terms of our economies. It did seem a little bit odd to me if the concern is foreign influence that you would just send that to another state. I think um, Senator Mark Warner actually introduced a policy at the national level to make sure that there were more protections in place for American intellectual property and that seemed like a much better strategy than sending all of our potential jobs out of the state. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Mark Warner's got a tremendous mind for, you know, for business and banking, and, uh, and, and he was 100% right. I, I think so as well. And um, so I'm, I'm curious if uh, this was actually a question that um, I saw the, um, the Virginia League of Conservationist Voters was interested in. They were very involved with getting the VCA passed. And um, I think there's curiosity if you would support strong judges who would hold our utility companies accountable for the state's clean energy standards, if that would be a part of your consideration. Oh, well, well certainly it is, uh, you know, I would have a larger role in that if I did, in chair, did indeed chair that committee, which I do not know, you know, that, that I would. But right now we're in a situation where uh, Republicans control the House, Democrats control the Senate. So even proposals where you get one, we get one, we'll, we'll let you choose yours, you know, and you, you don't say anything about who we choose, and they didn't go for it. Um, you know, I think they were hoping that things could turn around in this election and that uh, they could get two uh, judges who were more favorable toward business and less towards labor. Uh, and, uh, and I want to make sure we have a, a, you know, a balance. And uh, that's a very important consideration. There are three SEC judges. Uh, that we appoint, and they, you know, make the determinations about rates, about, uh, uh, you know, how insurance operates, how any number of businesses in Virginia uh, are regulated, and, uh, uh, you know, we just want, you know, good people uh, who are fair-minded, who are balanced, uh, who can, you know, who can make measured determinations based on the data, based on what's best for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and make those decisions, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, and we have a great SCC staff, and uh, right now they just have one judge. They're bringing in retired uh, judges to uh, fill in, but we need to get that solved, and uh, I, it doesn't look like that's going to happen until uh, the next session. Uh, so the Democratic majority in the Senate has been described as a brick wall mm -hmm. because we've got that slim majority and we've been able to um, block some of the Youngkin administration priorities from getting passed and that includes protecting women's access to reproductive mm -hmm. health care. Um, but I believe that Governor Youngkin is also not supportive of the Virginia Clean Economy Act or the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So if Republicans get a trifecta, what would that potentially um, look like? Well, I think two years from 2000 to 2022, when Eileen Fillercorn was speaker, Dick Saslaw was uh, majority leader, and Ralph Northam was governor, we made tremendous progress in the state. We brought Virginia into the 21st century. You know, we were leading the South 
uh, were we to, if Governor Youngkin gets his trifecta and, and for the last two years of his administration has a Republican Senate and House, all the work we've done on guns, women's reproductive, reproductive rights, voting rights, nobody talks about that much, but we got a lot done there to make it easier for people to vote. All that will get undone. Uh, uh, you know, I especially worry, and, and I agree with uh, uh, Delegate Dan Helmer, is that we need a constitutional amendment to, uh, uh, to protect uh, a woman's right to make her own decisions about whether she has an abortion or not. It's none of our, you know, none of our concern. And uh, you know, as long as it's done with, a, you know, with appropriate safeguards, and, and it, you know, it, it, it's critical that we, you know, that we do that. So there's a lot of effort being put into it. Governor Youngkin has a tremendous amount of money. We're we're doing our best to try to match that. Uh, we threw away an awful lot of money on the Democratic side in, in uh, primaries. My own primary was somewhere around a million five, million six between myself and, and uh, my opponent. Uh, we prevailed, in, you know, in that. A couple of my colleagues didn't, uh, but we won by 26 points. And I think, uh, you know, the message that we had about protecting voting rights, uh, about protecting our environment, protecting a woman's right to choose, and making sure that we get sensible gun laws. I had a bill last year. The biggest problem we're having with guns in this Commonwealth right now is guns stolen from cars. 2010, we changed the rule from you didn't have to, from having to have a concealed weapons permit for a gun in your car to not. And it came over as, yes, you can have one without a permit, but it has to be locked. Governor McDonald amended it to secured, which means in the door slot, in, the, in between the seat and the center console, and it passed, but, but despite our objections on the, on the Democratic Senate side. And now Richmond had 714 stolen last year. Wow. 3,000, uh, excuse me, 1,300 stolen from Lynchburg over the past four years. Portsmouth, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Port, uh, uh, you name the city, Newport News, Hampton, uh, it's an epidemic. The state police have pictures of kids walking down the street, shaking car doors. And when I ran the juvenile detention center in uh, Virginia, um, or, uh, or in Fairfax County, and then the Department of, of Juvenile Justice, youth gang members would, who were running cars up and down the East Coast for parts would say, yeah, look, every fifth or sixth car we steal, we get a great gun. Uh, that was the bonus, they got to keep that. And uh, you know, that, was, that was worth money. And that's what I think is behind the rise in uh, violence that we're having is we've had 10 years now of these uh, illegal guns uh, getting into the economy that people are either using or selling. And, they're, they're, uh, and trust me, the League of Conservation Voters, are, excuse me, or, or the, the League of, uh, of Women Voters are not the ones taking these guns out of cars. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is kids and they're, they're uh, creating a real public safety threat. So uh, how can our audience support you in the November 7th election? Well, I think what you need to do is write our governor uh, and make sure that we uh, continue with a Democratic majority in the Senate and let's flip the, the House of Delegates back and then I'll elect a Democratic governor and get us back on the progressive path. Thank you for being here and that's all for tonight. Have a wonderful evening.